Paul Russell suggested we continue to do what we do. But what are we to do? As you have heard, he had some interesting ideas about that, some of which, like his teacher, Elvin Semrads, he kept under wraps. He gave us some strong hints, however, of what to do. Negotiation, containment, especially affective competence, which you have heard discussed. But like Semrad, he was a non-combative man with hints of something else beneath the surface. I knew Semrad as his resident, assistant, then as colleagues for more than 20 years. I did not know Paul so well, but I did have the privilege of knowing a number of his patients after he died and thereby learning some details of what he did. I believe the gift Russell and Semrad shared was the level of engagement, the level of engagement they could achieve with patients. It was a stunning experience in residency to see Semrad establish his level of engagement. As a competitive and eager resident, making my way in the system, I would present, like most of the others, the patients with as much pathological detail as I could muster. So that by the time I was through with the history and the mental status, the description of the patient, we had before us generally some kind of pathological monster. <clears throat> I discovered it was easy to create monsters with our system of diagnosis and symptoms, syndromes. It was easy to create monsters out of even the most ordinary citizens. But then Semrad and the patient would sit down together head to head and after a few moments, not always, but often, they would begin talking about not trivialities, not the weather, not the Red Sox, but the deepest matters, and talking about them with a clarity and directness and sharing of feelings that was astonishing after such a description. He was acknowledging, bearing, and even putting in perspective often many aspects of these people's lives. Where was my monster now? This wasn't supposed to happen. The ideas from analysis I was taught about psychosis particularly meant that the patients had primitive drives and primitive defenses, profound regressions that seemed, at least on the surface, to be uh, impenetrable. And then on the biological descriptive side, the brain was meant to be deformed. Bad circuitry, atrophy of lobes, all kinds of things which would not seem to respond to a gentle Middle Westerner like Semrad's approach to the patient. So how do we understand it? How do we understand it now? How did we understand it then? No one seemed to. No one even wanted, seemed to want to talk about it. <coughs> but at that point in my life, I was writing my first book, Approaches to the Mind. And in the course of that, I discovered that I needed to figure out what the different schools actually did, how they dealt with the patient before them, what kind of relationships they established, the means they used to establish those relationships, whether they emphasized uh, understanding the patient in the sense of intellectually cognitive, grasping the patient, understanding in a more empathic sense, whether they were simply wanting to describe the patient's symptoms, whether they wanted to manage the patient in a personal way. Those were the kind of questions that were coming into my mind. And after <clears throat> some considerable study, the whole book took about eight to ten years, I began to realize that I thought I knew where Semrad came from. So in my eager way, I, I went to him. He and I had our offices together for 50, next to each other for 15 years. I went to Semrad and I told him. I said that he'd come out of Husserl and Jaspers, Binswanger, Minkowski, Manfred Boss, Carl Rogers, and, and even in the early in those days, in the closing 60s and early 70s, there were hints that there was something of the same thing coming out of Chicago once again from Kohut. We discussed this off and on for, for several months in his wonderfully polite and accepting way. He didn't fight with me. He wondered. He didn't agree. He, uh, he never agreed, except to say to me that, well, perhaps I was right. Perhaps I was right. There was no disclosure on it at all. But he did make one request to me at that time. He said to me, Leston, don't tell them downtown. 
Of course, he meant don't tell them in the, in the Institute. He felt already he was too much of a Will Rogers, too much of a country bumpkin to withstand this association with, with existentialism. Now, I don't pretend to, to have ever been able to establish, or at least not often to be able to establish, the same level of engagement that both Elvin and Paul established in their, in their everyday clinical work. But I learned some of the things about doing that from them and from Sullivan and, um, and some ideas of my own, so that that whole task of deepening the level of engagement became, became central to my interest, too. Paul Russell always had that same goal, I think, and I want to speak about the way in which he approached it. Russell faced a kind of Rubicon, I would like to say, a limiting point, a dangerous traverse to make in his thinking about this problem. And it was at the center of his idea of affective competence. He wanted to be able to talk about love in the clinical engagement. He wanted to be able to talk about love in the clinical engagement, not in the abstract, but as it as it was experienced between the two parties, a clinical intimacy. He wanted to be able to talk about that freely and openly. Now, love in the clinical encounter is a well-kept secret. Not sex. I'm not talking about sex. That's much spoken about. But my understanding is that actually therapists and patients commonly love each other, especially in long-term work. That they experience a degree of intimacy that neither one of them may have experienced before, often the patients have not, certainly. It is quite an ordinary thing. Perhaps it's like love in the family. And yet I say it's a well-kept secret. You remember that there was a moment early in the history of psychoanalysis when Jung came to Freud and urged him to stop talking so much about sex. He said it was, it was hurting the movement. It was bad PR. It would keep people from listening to other things that an analyst were discovering and wanted to say. Now, we all know that, that Freud was not dissuaded from talking about sex. He went right on talking about sex in many other manifestations. Perhaps Freud had less trouble with sex in the clinic than Jung did. As a result of that, we, the rest of us, ever since, have been able to talk about sex clinically and, and, and in, in many other ways, of course. But what about love? What is it about love that makes it seem such a, a dangerous topic in many people's minds? Now, I don't mean to, to confuse. I don't mean to confuse love and sex. My impression is that uh, men often do confuse love and sex, although a male psychoanalyst, Robert Stoller suggested that in many ways they're the opposite of each other. That, that sex, for its, in its most exciting, often seems to depend upon hostility, uh, kind of screwing it, hurting the other person, and also an anonymity, anonymity of the person who's being sexually used. I don't mean that sex and love are you know, bound to be opposed to one another, but they often are. I, want, I believe that Russell wanted to be able to talk about love with just as much freedom as Freud gave us to talk about sex, and just as much professional, professionalism. He wanted, I believe that, that Paul Russell realized an ideal that I myself have for psychotherapeutic and analytic work, that is to be as fully professional and as fully human as we can be. We can't be fully professional without bringing the whole of human experience, including love and hate, into the clinical discussion. And we can't be fully human if we have to act on our impulses, if we can't just talk about them, if we have to repeat them in the clinical situation and can't use the clinical situation as a forum, as a discourse in which these, these feelings can be understood. In the course of my getting to know some of Paul Russell's patients, I learned that he made a statement 
that strikes me as almost a signature statement as to how he set about making love part of ordinary clinical discourse. Now, not love, understand, not love that the patient might want to or have towards someone else, but as it appeared, as we would say, in the transference, in the relationship, as it appeared, his signature statement goes something like this. Paul would say to patients whom he felt strongly about, patients with whom he had developed a significant, intimate relationship, patients who, and patients who needed, who needed to hear that such an intimate relationship was possible for them, perhaps they had never experienced, or people who had experienced it before had lost it because of some tragic event, like the loss of a beloved child, which had separated them, it seemingly separated them so much from human feeling. His remark was this, how wonderful that we love each other. Paul said to the patient, how wonderful that we love each other. Notice what he is doing. He is expressing what he means. He is expressing what he feels. Not only what he feels, but what, the pa what he believes the patient feels. And he is taking responsibility for saying it. Because he knows that so often in despair, the patients, without that conviction, cannot introduce that, cannot make that leap. I doubt that he would say that to people he felt were entitled people who he thought might take advantage of such a statement from him, people who really felt, if anything, more likely to be already in fusion with the therapist. But for those in which there was despair, this was a remarkable effort to bring the fullest range of feelings, shared feelings, into the clinical situation. I like the bravery of this and its very specific purpose. I also don't understand why we can't talk about love in the clinical situation, even as we feel it for one another in the clinical situation. I am also sympathetic because long ago I began urging people to share hate in the clinical situation, what, what I call counter-projection as a way of reducing and helping to understand in paranoid situations the terrible fury that developed. That too, that too was misunderstood or frightening to people or that seemed to them often like a manipulation. Above all, I like the idea of being able to bring all affects into the clinical encounter, knowing of course it will be misused, that, those, that there are people that will make it into a kind of a cult who speak as about loving the patient even when you know they don't love the patient or pretending to love the patient, feeling that they ought to love the patient when the real issue is whether this love has developed between one another. Now I don't pretend to have done a great deal of, of this in my own clinical experience. Um, I, uh, but what I have done has made me think that what, what Paul Russell suggested was well worth exploring. And what I want to do in the remaining uh, part of this talk is to suggest some of the ways that I understand this signature statement, this bringing of a joint of felt intimacy into the clinical situation openly, how I understand that. First of all, as a transference interpretation, we might say, this statement of Paul Russell can be understood as a kind of transference interpretation. Why? Because it addresses the patient's conviction that he or she cannot be in an intimate connection and opens it up for discussion. It, it, it essentially says to the patient, I know the difficulties you have in this, and yet I feel this already exists. Can't we, can't we accept this possibility and think about this possibility between us? And it's my responsibility to say that to you first, because I know something of your despair. I think all those things are, are inside Paul's signature statement. Above all, it does not allow the patient's despair and the therapist's feelings and the patient's possible hopes to pass unnoticed. We can also think of this statement as, as something like intersubjective empathy. That is, it extends empathy 
beyond getting with the patient's feelings to getting with the feelings that both parties have, the affective attunement that both feel for one another. So it sets the problem of intimacy up in the relationship. It's also a leap to the we, we can say. A recognition that as soon as we meet people, there is a kind of we-ness that can be established. And when we know people well, and when feelings have deepened between us, then there is a need to establish that weeness as a fact in the relationship and to be discussed uh, openly. It seems to me obvious too that, that being able to make this statement is part of Paul Russell's concern about effective competence. Of course, it says that I am not afraid to have these feelings, to talk about these feelings, that I am competent to handle these feelings in the relationship and to handle you, the patient's feelings, perhaps of the same kind. I am also, he says, willing to take responsibility for this that I feel in myself. I'm not afraid. I don't have to run away from these realities of our relationship. It also says along the lines of competence, I am not afraid that I am going to act on it. I, this does not mean that we must go to bed together. It just means that we love each other. That there is something here that is wonderful that you, the patient, may not believe in or may not have experienced anywhere else. And we want that opportunity to be open for you, not only by being spoken about here, but above all, by being able to come into existence in one's whole life. So as transference interpretation, as intersubjective empathy, as a leap to the we, and as, a, as perhaps above all in this conference about Paul Russell, as a, as a striking, stunning demonstration of his efforts and his success in demonstrating affective competence, this signature statement seems to me to have a special place. I think Paul Russell wanted to do for love what Freud had done for sex. That is to be able to talk about it, to think about it, to deal with the problems of it. Indeed, this movement from, to love might well help rejuvenate the field as it was rejuvenated by Freud's willingness to be courageous and talk about sex. Thank you very much. <laughs>